We want to deal with the whole issue of counseling drug abuse and addiction. And um, in this particular uh, class period, um, and to help us understand this, let's take a look at a couple introductory things here. First of all, chemical abuse counseling, even, when uh, even with dedicated Christians, is often really a very difficult and long process. Uh, for people that are not fond of counseling or people who don't want to exercise the patience that's needed in this particular type of counseling, uh, with this particular type of counseling problem, are going to have difficulty um, really seeing this through to the very end. If you're serious about counseling another believer with this particular problem, you've got to be patient and long-suffering. This is what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 talks about. Um, it says that we have to be patient with all men. Uh, everyone that we work with and counsel, it's vitally important that we're patient with them, especially in this area. Um, and there are so many kinds of different temptations that are a part of this world today that Christians can get, get involved in. Um, now, right from the very outset, I want to let you know that I don't like the word addiction. Uh, it comes from a Latin word, addictus, um, which means to say or to favor, which really carries the idea of involuntary favor or hopeless dependence. It carries that idea. And that's not the idea that we want to give to our counselees when we're working with someone with a chemical or drug abuse problem. I only use the word because well, it's common for our culture. And that's the reason why I have, in a sense, assented to use the word. The, the, the better biblical label is bondage or enslavement. Because as soon as you use that term, the Bible doesn't use the word addiction. It uses bondage and enslavement. As soon as you use that, then somebody can always be freed or liberated from that particular problem. In other words, it opens up all kinds of biblical texts um, for liberation. So, um, the, I prefer using bondage and enslavement, and often will, will do that, especially um, in dealing with the issue of chemical abuse and, um, and drunkenness, uh, what is oftentimes referred to as alcoholism, although I don't like that term because that has disease and illness oriented connotations to it and you'll see why a little bit later on why I say that. Alright, let's clarify addiction from a biblical standpoint and I think these are, this in a sense sets the theological backdrop to dealing with enslavement, chemical enslavement or if you will addiction. First of all, man is dependent by nature. Man is dependent by nature. That's the way in which God created him um, as a dependent creature. You can see this in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3 where um, um, <clears throat> it's a description of the temptation of Jesus and of course Satan the tempter comes Verse 3, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Command that these stones become bread. Um, now what is Satan referring to? Satan is referring to the fact that man needs food to live. Alright? Uh, even Satan understands that. And in that sense, man is a very dependent creature. We're dependent upon food in order to remain alive. Um... And then later on, Jesus talks about there in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 32. He says, Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? With what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. All right, now again, you notice how God defines them as needs. Those are physiological needs. The need for, um, to drink, the need to eat, the need for shelter and clothing are very fundamental needs, but that's not what we ultimately is uh, 
as uh, God's people strive after. Well, that just illustrates the fact that the way that we're created is that we are dependent by nature. Well, then secondly, man was created to live dependently on God in order to find life and blessing. You can see this in Deuteronomy 8, 3, in Psalm 36, 9, Psalm 119, 109. We, we are totally and absolutely dependent upon God. Our very next heartbeat comes from Him. We would not be able to breathe if it were not God sustaining our life. So we're created to be dependent upon Him. Yet because of our sin, this brings us to our third point, man strives for autonomy and self-sufficiency. Man strives for that. He wants to be independent of God. He doesn't like to be uh, called uh, to, to be a dependent creature. Fourthly, man remains a dependent creature in spite of his sin. In spite of the fact that he strives for autonomy and self-sufficiency, he still remains dependent. That doesn't change who he is. He can uh, labor one way or another to try to free himself from that dependence. And it's amazing to me how arrogant we can be about our lives and how we think that we're in control of our lives and how extremely dependent we are. We're dependent upon not only uh, food and water and clothing, but we're dependent upon atmospheric pressure. We're dependent upon the actual tilt of the earth. Uh, if the earth were to tilt one or two degrees in either direction, either we would cook or we would freeze to death. We're dependent upon that. Um, if we were suddenly put in outer space, our bodies would explode because of all the internal pressure without some kind of pressure suit. Um, we're, we're, we're so totally dependent upon things that we don't even acknowledge. And that's the way God has made us. To be, be dependent upon these things. So that ultimately, I believe, that we would acknowledge Him as the ultimate one whom we are dependent upon. Well, fifth, um, his dependence then turns to other things. So our own sinful nature, our own sinful desires and cravings cause us to, to be dependent upon things that we, God hasn't designed for us to truly need. And what oftentimes drives that idolatrous cravings is um, both non-physiological as well as physiological cravings. Non-physiological cravings, things like um, approval. I, I want to be um, approved by other people. And my friends, um, I want them to like me. I want them to accept me. I want them to approve of me. They take drugs, so I'm going to take drugs. They drink alcohol to excess. I'm going to drink alcohol to excess. So, and what, so what is it that starts this dependency? What starts it is a non-physiological desire which ends up in a physiological desire. So now, now I become dependent. And these things end up becoming idolatrous desires that take up residency in our heart. We can see this in, in Proverbs 19.27 and Galatians 5.20 and Colossians 3.5 and 1 Peter 4.3, 1 John 5.21. All these things are desires that tend to consume the heart and drive us forward. So... Um, the, the, these are key. Sixth, man then is captivated and ensnared by desires. He trusts and loves, uh, resulting in this addiction, addiction, or we would get, again say bondage or enslavement. Um, man is captivated by these things. Um, oh, let's pick out a couple of these passages that you can see uh, listed here. But Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22 uh, would be a good one to go to. Uh, here's a good description of man, and the context here has to do with uh, sexual enslavement. But it says that man gets to the point that he feels he can't say no to the things that drive him towards this. His own iniquities will capture the wicked, verse 22 says, and he will be held with the cords of his sin. Now, the Bible's not being literal here in the sense of uh, there's actual cords that tangle him up. It's a metaphorical usage of how a man feels. And that is, 
He feels like he can't say no to this. This is this feeling of helplessness, of being out of control, uh, that I believe is part of God's design. It's his misery index on sin. It's what Romans 8 calls enslavement to corruption. All right? It's all of that. Um, he feels captivated by these things. Um, go over to Proverbs chapter 29. I know that's not up there, but Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 6, where it says, By transgression an evil man is ensnared. But the righteous sings and rejoices. That, there's a sense of freedom there. In other words, if we can continue in purposeful sin, it has an enslaving quality to it. Or to use the contemporary language, it has an, an addictive element to it. If we continue steadfast in sin. Um, so, we could say this. The last point we want to make here in this first section is that people become dependent because they are dependent. That's who they are. Um, it's no wonder uh, that they become dependent on things around them that they don't need to be, be dependent of. Well, furthermore, let's take a look at the biblical definition. The biblical definition here is an idle relationship with a mood-changing experience when it comes to chemical uh, enslavement or chemical ad addiction. It's an idle relationship. And the reason why we express it that way is the way in which we've talked about it before in some of our other topics, and that is it is something that has become more important than God that I'm willing to sacrifice my morality, I'm willing to sacrifice my health, I'm willing to sacrifice my relationship to God, my relationship, the loved ones around me, in order to achieve or to have what, whatever that is, whatever that chemical may be. And that's where that has become man's God. And there's that idle relationship. For those who use depressants like alcohol, it often begins with the relief from tension and stress the alcohol provides. It eventually becomes a demanding denet necessity um, in them. So that's where it becomes an idol. I have to have it. It defines normality for me in my life. If having that drug is normal life, then I am enslaved to that drug. If having alcohol is what is normal for my life, then I am enslaved to that alcohol. Or for those who use stimulants like cocaines, amphetamines, uh, methamphetamines, or often referred to as ice or Ritalin, it's often an experience of pleasure or high that it provides. So with depressants like alcohol, it, it's, it's a sort of relief that comes that is part of the bodily experience that a person desires. With stimulants, it has to do with a, a high that's there, and you get hooked into that high, and then with hallucinogens, um, oh, you can get LSD or PCP, uh, these quote-unquote designer drugs are often seeking new experiences and an escape from reality. They, they send me, us off into this illusionary escape from reality. Back during the 70s, during the 1970s, the drug culture was so prevalent on high school and college campuses where uh, the flower children, that's what they'd use. They'd use LSD or uh, some other form of drug to get them to escape from reality and enter into this imaginary world where colors were incredibly vivid, where flowers were floating in midair or some kind of bizarre thing. And, and it could go to the extreme where they would see horrible um, uh, images uh, very vivid yet horrible ima images that are there. So they're all kind. There are, we could really divide these chemical uh, problems into these three broad categories: depressants, stimulants, and hallucinogens. Depressants, in a sense, give a sense of relief from tension. Stimulants give an high, and hallucinogens basically are new experiences that help us to escape from reality. You know, I'm tired, I'm bored, I don't know what else to do, and so I'm going to use an hallucinogen uh, 
in order to escape from this reality and experience whatever uh, that thoughts that that hallucinogen provides in my life. Um, then there's, uh, secondly, a substance is used because the person wants to change how or he or she fi feels. Um, uh, he relies upon it ultimately to escape from life's um, obligations or troubles or misery. As the example that uh, King Lemuel's mother gives him. Um, that's the way people escape from their miseries using this. Um, Jesus refused to use any kind of substance, wine mixed with gall or myrrh, to blunt even the extreme pain of crucifixion. He didn't want any of that to be the case. And so in Matthew 27, 34, Mark 15, 23, the Bible says he refused it even though they wanted to give it to him uh, in the early stages of the crucifixion. Many believe that constant pleasant sensations in life is a natural right as well. I've got to be, um, I've got to feel happy. Um, I've got to feel pleasant or I've got to have, maintain a constant high. That's my right, isn't it? As a human being to feel that way. Um, well, this is the problem that in a sense Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes 2.2 2, where he stimulated his body with wine. The, the, the Hebrew literally says he used wine to stimulate his body on a regular basis. But then later on he talks about the fact that um, it, it just brought him grief in the final analysis. And only, it only was a passing pleasure at that particular point. But later on it brought him when he came off of his drunken stupor, it just left him with a hangover. Um, so, um, but the people pursue this because it gives them some kind of uh, pleasure in life. It's interesting what the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 11.25 about Moses. Uh, Moses refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter and he chose... Um, to be associated with the people of God rather than uh, to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin um, in Egypt. He chose to do that. Um, so the Bible says that there are significant crossroads we reach in our lives and the choices we make at those crossroads, whether to follow pleasure and the life of ease or to follow that which is moral and godly, is a critical decision. If we follow the path of pleasure and ease, then we become trapped to our own emotions and feelings as we saw back in Proverbs 5.22. Um, so many people think that that's their natural right when supposedly it offers um, freedom. In reality, there's nothing but bondage. Well, thirdly, then anyone can become an addict and anything can become an addictive substance. Uh, John Calvin said that the human heart is a constant idol factory. Conceptual and somatic or bodily desires uh, that become more important than being a man or woman of God becomes a heart idol. We can see this in Colossians 3, 5. This thing is what I really live for. That chemical, that fix, that high that sense of relief or that escape from reality is what I ultimately live for. Or any substance that causes desirable brain endorphins that opiate the receptor neurons has the potential to become an enslaving chemical. So anything that does that um, can cause a person to be enslaved uh, to those pleasurable sensations. It habituates the body, is what it does. It habituates the body. And that's what, this is when it becomes um, something that I have to have in order to enjoy a normal life. So anyone can be an addict, and anything can become an addictive substance if it is desirable. Well, then, fourth, the ultimate source of addiction is not in the substance, but in the person. Now, this is a critical issue here. 
The ultimate source of the addiction is not in the substance. Ultimately, it's in the person. It comes from the inner man and what he trusts and what he believes and that are very, very powerful motivations. What he trusts and believes that are very, very powerful motivations. Statistics demonstrate that, that more actual alcoholics, quote unquote, in the United States stop drinking entirely on their own than stop drinking through special therapy groups. That is, people basically decide for one reason or another that I'm going to stop drinking. Maybe they come to conviction about the fact that this drink is sending me into poverty, into the poorhouse. And um, uh, so, and I don't want to be poor all my life. So, on the basis of just sheer pragmatic um, finan financial expediency, I've decided not to drink anymore, even though everything in my body says I want another drink. Um, or, in one case that I'm aware of, there was a man who was a pretty heavy drinker. Uh, he was a single guy, and a woman became interested in him, and she became really interested in her. And, but yet, she let him know, I can't have any kind of relationship with you as long as you're a drunk. I'm not going to have anything. And that was a very powerful motivation for him to stop. Now, in, the previous, in previous circumstances, this guy had tried every kind of um, program in order to get him off of alcohol. But the only thing that ultimately worked was the love of a woman. That's what brought him out of it. Now, if that's the case, then if th a person who comes to you, and as far as you can tell, they genuinely understand the gospel, they have committed their life to Jesus Christ, but they're under the powerful influence of some kind of chemical addiction, their love for God should be infinitely more powerful than their love for anything or anyone on this earth. Infinitely more powerful in bringing them out of this. Uh, furthermore, people have more control than they are willing to admit. Um, that's part of the problem. They believe, and here's the key, they believe the feelings and sensations of their body more than they believe the word of God. They believe, I can't say no to this. They believe that more than the word of God, where the word of God says, no, you can say no to this. The person's life now centers around worship of that experience. That's what ends up happening. It centers around worship of that experience. God created all men to be worshipers. We've understood that in this class up to that now. And any worship that is not of the true God of heaven is false and it is an idolatrous type of worship. To worship the gods of chemical abuse, a person must be willing to sacrifice and pay homage to them. Everyone and everything else is sacrificed. God is robbed of rightful worship and becomes a distant second to the substance. So, there is a sense in which um, a person is willing to sacrifice their health and as I said before, relationships and all their financial resources in order to get that next fix, in order to find some kind of satisfaction. They're even willing to steal from people that are closest to them in order to to be satisfied. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, there in the Decalogue, God talks about the fact that there shall be no other gods before me. And of course, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3, um, if you want to look at that real quickly, 1 Peter 4 and verse 3, where um, Peter says, uh, for the time has already passed, passed is sufficient for you uh, to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having per pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousals, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And then verse 4 says, And in all of this they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. Um, what is all of that? Well, um, well, because the Christians refuse to join the immoral parties put on by the world, and in this particular case, put on by the emperors of Rome, uh, 
um, these, then the people of the world are angered and they're upset. Um, well, and, and this, this type of thing replays itself over and over and over again in life. So, um, notice how Peter describes this. Um, the time has already passed. It's already sufficient that you've carried out the desires of the Gentiles. And that is following their pattern of living by their feelings. Living by their desires. Having per pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousals, drinking, parties, etc., etc., etc. So, um, this is where a person really ultimately worships that kind of life or that chemical. An idol ultimately makes us a slave. Um, a slave must heed the voice of his master. Romans 6.16 um, Substance abuse makes us subservient so that when the impulses of the body begin to demand fulfillment, it must be obeyed at all cost. And I'm willing to sacrifice everything in order to get to obey this. In order to be freed from slavery, then notice this, a death has to take place. When a slave dies, ultimately, that person is freed from slavery. Once and for all. So be, to be freed, the substance abuser must die. But in this particular case, the Bible talks about dying to self. That's where freedom ultimately comes. So when we're talking about ultimate liberation, we're talking about dying to self. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, where um, Jesus is talking, and he says, um, and he was saying to them, and the Greek gives the implication that this is not something that he did once to them, but it's something that Jesus repeatedly and continually said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Now, when Jesus says, um, if anyone wishes to come after me, I mean anyone, anybody's going to follow Jesus, let him deny himself. This is more than just giving up bubble gum for Lent. All right? This means denying self. I mean, denying yourself. Um, I remember our own president, uh, Dr. MacArthur, making the statement, you know, every day when there's something that I really want and I could le very legitimately have it, I deny myself that thing just to remind my body who's in control. That's a good practice. If I see something that I really want, I deny myself that thing just to remind my body who's in control. That's not a bad thing. That's a good practice. It's a practice of self-control. So, in, in this sense, you're dying to self. And then when it says, when Jesus says there in verse 23, take up his cross. Now, the cross back in ancient times was an... Um, a place where infamous criminals were put to death. Um, so, when he's saying denying self and taking up the cross, that means that you are to nail self to the cross. That's the idea. Nail self to the cross. So, and then he says, you're supposed to do that daily. That's the next word. Daily. We're supposed to treat self like an infamous criminal and nail self to the cross daily. Wow. And then follow me. That is, follow all the positive things that he did in terms of ministry for God and others. Follow him as an example. We're not just masochistic. Christians don't just deny themselves things like uh, these ancient monks uh, in order to experience pain. We don't love pain. Christians are not that way. No, we deny ourselves because it's good in terms of holiness and we nail self to the cross and we follow him positively. Not just in the process. There's not somehow some kind of innate holiness and in going experiencing self-denial. No, the positive side is following him and follow me. That is, do what I've done. Serve God, serve others, love God, love others.
So, so to be freed from a substance, a, an abuser must die to self. So the Christian abuser must present himself as a slave to righteousness, no longer as a slave to the weakness that's a part of his flesh. Romans chapter 6, verses 17 through 22 says, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you... Uh, uh, then deriving from the things of which you now are shamed. For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. So he views the benefit of being a slave to righteousness as twofold. That is, greater sanctification and holiness in our lives and ultimately eternal life. That he's not talking about the fact that we earn eternal life. He's talking about the fact that those who are genuine believers are uh, evidence that holiness and a death to sin and which ultimately ends up in eternal life. That's the idea. So, this is what the abuser must do. He must present himself as a slave to righteousness. No longer as a slave to the weakness of his flesh. No longer giving in to the weakness of his flesh. That's the key. An idol can make slaves of us. Well, but obviously this is not what the world sees, right? The world um, views alcoholism, or better yet from a biblical standpoint, drunkenness. <laughs> Uh, in a different way. They view it as primarily a disease. And we'll talk about this later. And there are several problems with this. One is the incompatibility of diagnosis and treatment. The treatment is not medical but moral. In other words, when there are many, many times where you can see this happen over and over again. I've seen it in, in my ministry as a pastor. People have gone into detox programs and they've treated the body and they've gotten the person to the point where uh, their body is no longer craving uh, in an, an exorbitant way that particular chemical. And so they release that person and for a while that person's doing fine. But then they end up going right back into it. And you say, why? After going through all the hardship of detox and all the chemical withdrawal and all the effects. Why would a person ever go back into this? The answer is very simple from a biblical perspective. It's because ultimately the body was addressed, but the heart was not. The reasons that they got involved in that particular problem at the beginning was never addressed. Um, all they did was treat it like a, a physiological disease. That's all they did. But that's not what got them into it. It was not something that all of a sudden they were just walking along the street one day and they'll... <gasps> I, I think I'm coming down with alcoholism. All right? It's not one of those things. Or they're, they're sitting at their desk one day and not basically doing anything, and they, oh, you know what? I think maybe I've caught the chemical abuse bug. All right? No, it's not one of those things. There's a whole history of thinking and a whole history of experience that goes behind the choices for that person to pick up that drug usage or that alcohol usage. There's a whole set. And that is best addressed by God. That's best addressed by Scripture. Heredity, genetic, or chemical imbalance causes point to medical solutions. Environmental causes point to behavioral therapy. But they ultimately ignore the primary cause. Um, what's the primary cause? That is, the heart and its belief system was never, ever challenged. It was never, ever challenged. 
a lack of empirical evidence to support the disease model as well. Uh, there's been constant studies, study after study after study, to try to demonstrate a biological, genetic, or hereditary cause to uh, drunkenness or to chemical abuse of some sort. sort. Um, all studies indicate there is no definitive organic causality. There is none. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't studies that seem to or kind of relate to. But if there's a causality, then it should be one for one. And what should happen every time you see those particular elements present, then 100% of the time that, should, that person should be uh, enslaved to that chemical. But that's not what happens. They'll say, well, 75% of the cases, this was the case. Well, then what happened to the other 25% where... Uh, the person had the markers that seemed to be genetic or uh, received in some kind of uh, hereditary involvement um, and, and, yet, and yet they're not an alcoholic or they're not involved in some kind of drugs. What's going on there? There are no studies that are definitive in this issue in terms of organic causality. It doesn't exist. All right. Thirdly, it reflects the frustration of those Trying to understand it. People don't know what else to call it. They don't know what else to call it. So they're going to call it a disease. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and especially how this got caught up with um, Alcoholics Anonymous. Then there is the presence of multiple addictions that damages the disease model. So then a person simultaneously has a variety of different addictions at the same time. Um, that tends to damage the disease model. Furthermore, we would say it's against God's law. It's against God's law. That's the key thing. Um, it is rebellion against the God's law, and it's rooted in choices that seem to be early in the history of that person, innocent choices, but it leads them into some kind of enslavement. It makes genuine repentance impossible because how do you repent of an illness? How do you repent of a disease? You don't. It underestimates the enemy and the enslavement to sin and how the enemy especially works in, inside um, on the heart of the person um, in terms of the temptations of the heart and how the enemy is clever at appealing to the temptations of the body. Well, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is addiction is not a disease. Addiction is not a disease. What are some of the characteristics then of a person who is an addict? This is important here. Uh, first of all, they are the type of people that desire short-term gratification. And usually there's a history of that prior to them getting involved in that chemical abuse. They've, they've, it, immediate gratification is uh, the pattern of their life. They want it and they want it right now. And a lot of their choices are made that way. Or they have addictive thinking, irrational cravings based upon expectations of a positive effect. That is, they live for that which is going to give them the most pleasure at that given moment in time. And that is enslaved type of thinking. It's when a person is feeling dominated instead of being com commandment dominated. Whatever is going to give them. There's increased tolerance. Now, not only is this tolerance, at first, when they first get involved in these kind of behaviors, there's a sense of guilt there. But as, as they continue to participate and become hooked in a greater fashion into that chemical abuse, then uh, their, their conscience is seared. Uh, it's okay. So they're willing to tolerate more. And their body demands more in order to have the... Uh, as their body adjusts to it, there is a physiological tolerance that comes, adjusts to that chemical, it demands more and more in order to receive the same sensation. There's a loss of control as time goes by. It seems like all they live for and all they think about is acquiring that particular substance. And they're willing to sin against others. They're willing to steal from others, uh, lie to others, be deceitful to their employer um, in order to have whatever it fixes 
it is that, that they demand or crave so much. The issue here is not personality. People do not, you can't find this in scripture at all, it's not present, people do not have an addictive personality. All right, Th That's not the key. They have an addictive sin problem is the issue. It has nothing to do with personality. Um, is it possible that some people, as a result of the composite of their personality, experiences and emotions that are part of their past, tend to be more susceptible to certain kinds of substances than other people? Yes, but that does not necessarily mean they have an addictive personality. That doesn't exist. Now, furthermore, what about the chemistry of addiction? Well, in this particular case, neurotransmitters are involved. For example, dopamine, commonly associated with the pleasure centers of the brain that provides feelings of enjoyment and reinforcement to motivate a person to seek specific pleasurable deeds of substance. It's released particularly in the areas such as the nucleus accumbens as well as uh, striatum uh, in the brain uh, by naturally rewarding experiences such as food, sex, use of certain drugs, and neutral uh, stimuli that become associated with them. In fact, this has been uh, demonstrated through placebo drugs where a person is given a placebo drug and certain pleasurable associations are associated with that almost in behavioral studies. Um, and so that person begins to think now that the pleasurable associations now are directly related to that particular placebo when there is nothing in that placebo that's producing those things. You know, the only thing that's producing it is their own thinking, you see. So um, that in a sense, if you will, is producing that dopamine. It's not the drug ultimately that produces it. It's their thinking ultimately that does. Um, the National Institute of Drug Abuse makes this statement. People hanker for drugs largely to re-experience the intense pleasures they recall from past episodes of drug abuse. Much research has shown that this pleasure occurs because drugs of abuse, each by its own pharmacological mechanism, uh, precipitate surges of dopamine in a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, or the NAC. So that's what is believed to happen. And in, in these, uh, when these drug, um, drugs tend to take hold, it, it affects the brain, it affects it in terms of dopamine. Now, there's a lot that we could say about this particular theory, but we don't want to spend time there. We want to spend time, in a sense, giving them biblical hope. We need to give them biblical hope. Yes. Um, in our culture, and I mean, this is just trying to figure out history-wise. Yeah. Why are drugs wrong? I mean, why is cocaine wrong? Why is marijuana wrong? From a perspective of <clears throat> from a from makes a someone perspective. feel good. Why? Why should? Yeah. Why do we say it's wrong when other countries say it's fine? Well, I think the answer to that, from a secular perspective, is that it's co corro corro yeah. corrosive. <laughs> there, I can say it. Corrosive to society. Okay. All right. They realize that people become so hooked on these things that they steal, they lie, they cheat, they'll kill, murder, in order to get them. So it's protecting culture. Yeah, concept. yeah, it's, it's protecting the societal structure, the common good of man, however that's defined. And of course, in our postmodern world, there is no final ultimate definition. It's all determined by the immediate culture um, that a person is. But that, that's the idea. I think that the ultimate reason is that it is coercive to society and interpersonal relationships and it destroys the structure of society. Yes? I, was gonna say, I would imagine a lot of people would say that might be true of some drugs, but for a lot of drugs it, they would say it isn't true. Right. Yeah. They would say, for instance, we could sit here and argue about the issue of marijuana and how addictive uh, marijuana is, even though there are a lot of studies that indicate that marijuana is the doorstep drug to all the harder drugs, okay? So we could sit there and talk about that, you know? And there, you know, you could parade different people, well, I smoked marijuana and I didn't get involved in harder drugs, and you know, you could parade all that kind of stuff there. Um, 
that's a debatable issue. Um, it, we, we could safely say this, that anything in society, it doesn't even have to be chemicals and drugs, that results in um, stealing, uh, cheating, murdering, maiming, maiming, killing, um, anything like that is considered to be anathema. And uh, it's just that these people seem to have a driving compulsion that seems to dictate that they can't say no to this for one reason or another. Yes? That's why it's amazing that the alcohol and alcoholism is like so widely accepted. Yes. But yet it has the same issues involved of the brain, right. the suffering, the murder, the whole, the whole gamut, but it's okay and these others aren't. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you're not going to be a pastoral counselor for very long without eventually somebody's going to come in and just pour their heart out about the heartache and the difficulty in their marriage or their family because of somebody who's a drunk. I mean, it, and I get mad. I get mad when I see beer trucks passing by because you, you, you can't, I'm going, man, look at the homes that are getting destroyed. Now, technically, can a person drink alcohol and not be that way? Yes. The answer is yes. Technically, that can be the case. But, uh, again, the danger is huge here. And, uh, and a lot of people that are hooked on it don't want to admit that they are. All right, let's talk about counseling the addict, and then we'll take a break. Just calling addiction sin doesn't necessarily help one to counsel the addict. It doesn't help. Um, normative, uh, we've got to look at things from God's perspective. What has God said to be normal? Uh, scripture says that man is dependent by nature, as we talked about before. Um, normal is not being enslaved by anything except for uh, being enslaved to righteousness. That's normal. That's what God defines as normal. Anything else beyond that is abnormal. What about the external situation? Well, what is the situation? What does this particular person face? You've got to be in touch with what's going on with this particular person. And how does the norm of God's law interpret the situation in the addict's life? How does the norm of God's law? So first, that, in, that assumes that you have a fix on what's happening in his life. I had a man that I worked with, oh, about 15 years ago. He was a guy who uh, married to a wonderful girl. They both came to our church, uh, but he struggled. He had a terrible alcohol problem. When he finally came clean about it, he found out that... Um, uh, all over the house, I mean, hidden up in the registers and <clears throat> hidden down in the floor underneath the floorboarding, he had alcohol hidden all over that house that she had no idea about. That's how deceptive he was and how that, thing, that stuff really controlled him. And he'd take a drink whenever he wanted. So the internal situation is key. What's going on in his life? What is he thinking? What's going on in his heart? What does he really want? Some of the common factors we're dealing with is oftentimes they have an inaccurate view of self or there's uh, an av a, uh, avoidance of conflicts and trials and so they use the drug as a way to get out of that. There's a lack of trust in God that's often here. Um, in fact, it's not often. It always is there because they really believe that the drug's giving them something that God is either unwilling to give them or cannot give them. And so they're willing to go to the drug in order to get it. And off, frequently, not always, there is perfectionistic tendencies in a person. I've got to be such a way. I've got to live in such a way. And so I need these drugs in order to live that way. All right? In order for me to calm down at, at work, I have to have a double shot of espresso. All right, that's the same thinking of a chemically enslaved person. Um, in fact, this particular person is enslaved to caffeine. Um, that's much more acceptable chemical in our culture, right? Out of Starbucks, 
Now, have I gone from preaching to meddling in your life? All right, it's much more acceptable. Um, or they desire quick fixes. Or they're motivated by fear. Or there are patterns and habits that are formed as a result of this. Peer pressure is a big one. This is usually the one here that often gets, uh, gets a person started in the use of drugs and alcohol is peer pressure. Yes? Just kind of flushing that idea out with caffeine or whatever. I mean, there's yeah. certain things in cultures that are just typically like a tea is a drink in, in sure. Europe. Where, where is the line between calling it a, um, a substance abuse and just kind of a habit of culture that's healthy? Is it, do you go back to the culture's line saying when he's really into rob and steal to get his Starbucks? Yeah. That's wrong or what, how, what's the biblical line for that? Or just that maybe masters you? Well, I, I, think, I think the biblical line, yes, has to do with the issue of mastering. Because the question that he's really asking for the sake of the tape is, uh, how, do, how do we know that this is really wrong? Or where, do, where is it that it really becomes wrong if we're dealing with, like, with issues of caffeine, that kind of thing? Well, I think the answer is, when I have to have it in order to function normally, then it becomes an issue. All right, I have to have it. And we may not steal, cheat, or murder to get our caffeine, but if I have to have it, otherwise I'm going to be irritable, I'm going to bite your head off, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have headaches all day long, um, and I'm not going to interact well with people. Now I'm resorting to sinful responses to people without that chemical. Right? Then that particular chemical has a control in my body and in my thinking uh, a mastery in my body and my thinking that it shouldn't have. All right. Furthermore, um, oftentimes there is also a trigger situation that occurs with a lot of abuse of chemicals. Um, for example, some kind of setback can, uh, can trigger this. Uh, some kind of trauma can, can trigger this. Or something as innocent as I'm not sure what to do with my spare time can be a trigger of this. Or maybe a guy's wife says something um, in, with a little bit of bite to it. And so, all right, if she's going to be that way, then I'm just going to withdraw to the, to the den with my beer and, and enjoy my evening. I'm not going to even, I'm not going to favor her with my presence. So there can be triggering situations like that. And family environment can be influential. It's not part of the cause of it, but it certainly can influence a person. If you've watched mom and dad deal with problems growing up, and the way they deal with problems is they resorted to the bottle, or they resorted to some pills to deal with problems, then chances are that's the way you've learned to do it. And so when you get into problems or stressful situations, you resort to the bottle or pills too. Yes? Could a trigger situation also be like a, you, I mean, you mentioned some negative examples. Could it be a yes. positive one too? Like yes. Go to a party with a no friend, then that starts you drinking. Yeah, yeah. Trigger situations can be positive, not just negative. Um, yeah, um, I was trying to think of another example that would maybe give you a positive um, uh, deal. Oh, well, like this is the reason why a lot of people go to bars to meet the a person of the opposite sex. It's because after they get a few beers in them, then all their inhibitions are gone. And they're willing to walk up to this girl that they think that's really pretty and they'll say to her, hey, sweetheart, how you doing? You know, where normally, in, when he wasn't a little bit soused or drunk, he'd never do that in a million years. Too many inhibitions. But all of that alcohol has kind of shed all his inhibitions. And, you know, and he wants to meet girls. And so well, how's he going to meet girls and be bold enough to do that? He's going to get drunk a little bit and go out and meet them. That's the way he's going to do it. So it can, in a sense, we could call that a positive type of situation. All right. Um, now, obviously, in something like this, there's the importance of accountability that we have to highlight here. This is really key. Um, because of the shame associated with chemical abuse, there's usually a considerable amount of deceit that goes along with it. And um, so they don't want to be known for what they're doing, and so they'll, they'll become deceptive. And there has often been a long history of giving in to the weakness of the flesh with this person's life. So serious repentance is evidence when the abuser will acknowledge that they cannot trust themselves. 
That's really critical. Um, serious repentance is evidenced here when the abuser will acknowledge that they cannot trust themselves. That's a critical acknowledgement. Family members then and Christian friends in the church can be an excellent source of accountability if the person is willing to mistrust the weakness of his or her own flesh. Now that's the, the critical qualifier here. All the accountability in the world is not going to work with a chemical abuser if they don't mistrust themselves. That is, it's almost as if this is the prerequisite. If they're not, if they still trust themselves, then they're going to find some way around the accountability you set up in their life. They're, they're going to, they're going to ultimately believe their own thinking. But if they really mistrust themselves on this, then they'll be thankful for the accountability, even though the accountability to them may seem harsh um, or difficult. Um, they're, they're going to accept it. They're going to um, be in favor of it. All right. We just finished, just before our break, dealing with the whole issue of the importance of accountability. Now, this brings us to Proverbs chapter 5, uh, 6, and 7. And I wish I had more time that we could spend working through this. We don't. But basically, we want to talk about, the Bible's very clear about the fact that these things have an alluring quality to them. Anything that's desirable does. has an alluring quality. Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, the primary issue here has to do with sexual issues. But uh, Proverbs also deals with a, a, the allurement of alcohol. And alcohol in Scripture, in a sense, is the paradigm for all kinds of chemical abuse. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 25, um, later on, and um, verse 30, it says, Those who linger over wine, those who go to taste mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. Uh, in other words, there is an alluring side to it that seems uh, desirable. Very similar to Eve in the garden looking at the fruit, right? There's an allurement to it. And then once a person gives themselves over to it and begins to sample it and take of it, then there's an attachment that forms. So there is that initial allurement and then there is that attachment. In fact, there in Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 32, it says, um, at last it bites like a serpent, it stings like a viper, your eyes will see strange things. Your mind will utter perverse things. Um, you become attached to this much the same way that you, in a sense, consume it, but it comes back and bites you, the Bible says. And now it has you under its spell, like the venom of a viper. All right? It has you under its spell. That's that attachment. Then there is often ritual that occurs with it. Everybody that has some kind of addictive bondage or enslavement goes through a ritualistic process in seeking it, um, in partaking of it. They have to be at a certain place or where other people don't see them or in a secret area. And understanding that and knowing that helps you to counsel them what to avoid, what to look for. Um, there's a ritual that goes along with the environment. And then there's constant reinforcement, which now, obviously, when that happens, then the body becomes accustomed to it. And the, where the mind is already gone, the heart is already gone, the heart has already given itself over to it, and the body just follows suit in this way. So, if we were to summarize this, we would summarize it like this, and then we'll get into this a little bit more in detail. Number one, the counseling must have a saving relationship with Christ. That's obvious. That's key. Um, uh, the counseling must understand the lordship of Jesus Christ in life. That's critical as well. Now, I want you to all take your Bible and go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, just for a moment. You can see this. Uh, 
this changes the way in which a person thinks of himself. Once he has a relationship with Christ and he understands the lordship of Christ, he says, um, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. Um, and then he says in verse 11 to these Christians, And such were some of you. In other words, they were changed. So the whole Alcoholics Anonymous thing that says once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic is not true. Such were some of them. Now he wouldn't be writing about this if they, some of these Christians weren't tempted to go back into some of these practices. They were being tempted to go back into these practices. But they're no longer drunkards. They're no longer revilers or so on. And remember how we said alcohol is the paradigm for all other chemical abuse in the Bible. Well, they're no longer that way. They've been washed. They've been sanctified. They've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. So they no longer should think like a drunkard. They no longer should think that they are a drunkard, even though they're tempted and they have been enslaved by a chemical. Okay? They no longer think that way. This, this is what we call understanding and thinking the Lordship of Jesus Christ in this area. It's a very critical issue. Counselees must understand the dynamic then of the idol relationship as well. You're going to have to explain this to them on how they bow down and worship at the altar of that particular chemical to provide them with what they need. Fourth, the counselee must repent at the level of the heart and the mind. Not just repent of the deeds of partaking it, but they've got to repent on a heart level uh, where they're willing to say it's the issues behind this physical addiction, it's my wrong thinking, my wrong belief system that I need to repent of if I'm going to be restored. And then the counselees must take responsibility for their daily renewal um, as well uh, for God to really change that and bring that about. Counselees must deal with idolatry in every area of life, which means that there is once a person is controlled by something and mastered by something like this, it affects every single area of their life. Counselees must understand that permanent change is a twofold process. It's not enough to just stop their drinking or stop their chemical abuse. They've got to replace it with that which is righteous kind of uh, deeds, the righteous kind of words, the righteous kinds of thoughts and desires. And until that replacement has achieved, until that replacement is automatic, uh, comfortable, and unconscious. Until that's the case, they have not fully and completely changed. It has to be automatic, comfortable, and unconscious. Then they've really changed. That's where permanent change takes place. The counseling must be willing to undergo radical amputation. That is, get, thing, get rid of things that are dear to him um, and places that he loves to go to um, in order to bring about that change. They must be accountable to and involved in worship and fellowship in the local church. That's going to be part of the put on. That's going to be part of the put on. Now, there's a few other issues before we get into this more in depth that we need to deal with here in finality. What about AA is the question. That's a critical question. Well, Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, let me see if I can. I'm going a little bit ahead of myself here. But um, Alcoholics Anonymous, in reality, um, can get people off of drug or especially alcohol uh, abuse. Um, one of my dear friends, Dr. Bill Good, used to say he had a, uh, a woman and her older teenage son come in because he had become quite a drunk even at a young age, this teenage boy. And um, Bill s started working with him. But the mother said, no, 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 I don't want him to go through biblical counseling. I want this guy to go through Alcoholics Anonymous. And Bill tried to persuade the mother and says, no, let's deal with this on a biblical level. Let's try to work on this so that there's real substantive change. No, the mother wanted to go through AA. So he, she took the boy and put him through the AA process. And Bill says... He went into AA, a cursing, hateful, 
God dishonoring drunk. And he came out the other end of AA, a cursing, God dishonoring, hateful, sober guy. Okay? Now, I think you get my point. The point is that they dealt with the physiological things that were going on. But they really didn't deal with the heart issues of the guy. So the, the propensity to go back into this is even greater. And the spiritual issues were never ever addressed. And then there are principles in AA that are just horrible principles from a Christian perspective. For example, you've got to be willing to submit to who you think you're, you've got to have a God that you submit to. But anything can be your God. The door can be your do God. A doorknob can be your God. A light bulb can be your God. As Christians, we ought to have problems with that. You know, pretty serious problems. Um, so, there are a lot of issues that, that are, there are problems with AA. What about the issue of codependency, which was something that came about in the late 1970s, early 1980s, which was actually typical, typified by a woman who's married to a drunken husband, and she is willing to lie to his employer because he has a hangover the next day and lie and say that he's really sick and he can't come into work today because she knows that if she confesses what he's really like, that he's a drunk, that he has a hangover, that he'll get fired, and then she doesn't have any income, and then they'll lose their home, and they won't have any way to feed their children. And so as a result of that, this is what the world used to call codependency. All right? This is a person who's, you have a person who's dependent, and then you have a codependent, a wife or someone else along that's willing to enable them in their chemical abuse or their substance abuse of some kind. That's what is going on. Well, what's going on from a Christian perspective? Are they really codependent? No, the issue is there is a fear of man here. And ultimately, a lack of trust in God's provision if we do the right thing. Imagine if, if Daniel did that in the lion's den. Um, then he would have succumbed. Or, or Paul would have done that. Um, um, or Peter before the Sanhedrin uh, would have caved in and um, opted with expediency. Th these, are, these are serious issues that co the concept of codependency brings out. What about in-house programs? There's a lot of detox programs. Some of them can be helpful if you have an extreme case. But for the most part, a lot of in-house programs are patterned after 12-step programs AA programs that have the same kind of basic principles. Are 12 step the same as AA? Not the same thing, but they're remarkably similar. Um, AA is basically the organization that developed the concept of 12 steps. What about medical help to overcome addiction? Again, that can be helpful. There are some drugs that help to step a person down off of the heavier drugs. But again, you're only addressing the body. You're not addressing the soul. Now, I passed out to you an outline that we want to develop a little bit further and follow along here as we do. Uh, later on, if you have, uh, I don't have it in your computer, you can actually type in the information there later on. But let's follow this outline along to help us clarify this. I think in dealing with this, particular problem of the chemical abuser. There are extremes that we see in Christianity. On the one hand, you can see we treat them as victims. There are a lot of Christians who do that. On the other hand, we treat them like villains. Okay? And we can go to one of those two extremes. For example, when we treat them as victims in terms of the problem, then we treat it like an incurable sickness. When we treat them as a villain, we believe that it's an unforgivable sin or the unpardonable sin. They're just a villain. They've committed this unbelievable sin and they can't ultimately change. When they we're dealing with a person, we kind of define them as having no will to change. There's no amount of willpower that can change it because they're basically diseased. They're a victim, whatever this is. On the villain's side, when we treat them this way, there's no way to change. Uh, they just basically have gone down this path where there is no way to turn around. Um, there's no way to change. For, from a perspective, um, 
Usually they're treated in the, on the victim side with pity and sympathy. On the villain side, they're treated with an attitude of superiority. Um, I'd never do that. On the victim side, the prescription is lifelong therapy. Uh, that's where you get this idea, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. You always have to consider yourself that way. You're always going to have to be a part of an AA group in coming off of this. Um, if you treat the villain side, it's instantaneous change. Uh, the, if there's going to be any hope, it's got to be immediate and instantaneous. Um, so on the victim side, if you treat them as an incurable incur illness, no will to change, with pity and sympathy, lifelong therapy... Really, in the final analysis, there is no hope. That's the prospect. On the villain side, there's no help. You know, I would never do this. I mean, you're, you're the dredge of society uh, if, you, if you are the type of a person who would participate in this. Now, I think that there is a much more biblical way in dealing with a chemical abuse. From God's perspective and the problem... We view it not as a sickness and not as an unpardonable sin, but as a life-dominating sin. That's different. It's a life-dominating sin. So we take exception to both sides. The person, instead of being no will to say, change or no way to change, in this particular case, Christ provides both the will and the way. Philippians chapter 2. It's God who works in us both the will and to do according to his good pleasure. From the perspective, I think we should view them from a standpoint as a caring confronter. Someone who cares and genuinely loves them, but are willing to confront them with their deceit or dishonesty and um, with areas in their life that they're blind to. The prescription then is progressive sanctification. Rarely, rarely does God bring about instantaneous change, and it certainly does not require lifelong therapy. What's the prospect, ultimately? Then I think when we handle it God's way, it's real, complete transformation. It's real, complete transformation. Now, here's one of the problems. I think that the Christian community here sends out a mixed message. On the one hand... The chemical abuser is greeted with the attitude of victimized p pity. On the other hand, they may be greeted with an attitude of hostile piety. Neither of those are correct. Christians will never be able to fully understand the problem of chemical abuse until they fully understand what ultimately God says about it. Which brings us to the major debate that we hinted at earlier. The sin or sickness debate. The medical model basically says that it's a sickness, it's an illness. The central issue in this debate is the concept of control. The medical model that talks chemical abuse as a sickness and demonstrates its argument by studies suggesting that a loss of control comes from physiological abnormalities. Bio, uh, psycho, social disease, they would call it. And the allergy anal an, uh, analogy was a part of the early days. Um, let me go back to that and make a couple comments. In the early years of Alcoholics Anonymous, it was believed that some people were allergic to alcohol and could not drink it, even in small quantities. Otherwise, they would suffer an adverse reaction to it. Uh, but you can see how we talk about it here. There has been no, has been little scientific support for the allergy form of the disease model. However, alcoholism is not an allergy. No antigen antibody response has been found to be associated with alcohol in humans. End of quote. That's taken out of a primer for today's substance abuse counselor. There's no, yet, that was a very common view. The second is the biochemical imbalance view. Several researchers believe that the reason that almost 80% of those who prematurely exit from treatment programs do so because of deep cravings that come from chemical imbalances in the brain. It's believed that the raising or the lowering of available neurotransmitters in the brain is the key to becoming an addict. For instance, cocaine pushes the neurotransmitter dopamine out of the sending neurons and the addict experiences a stimulated mood. Narcotic substances like opiate, like heroin, resemble natural painkillers in the body and depressants, alcohol and barbiturates have been linked to inhibiting neurotransmitters, GABA. 
When alcohol is consumed, it decreases the GABA receptor sites in the neurons, making more GABA available in the body, resolving in a feeling of relief from the tension. In each case, the body becomes accustomed to and even craves these chemical substances to restore the pleasant experiences. Until the cravings are satisfied, the abuser then will experience radical mood changes beyond his control. Well, there's problems with this. First of all, biblical counselors accept the premise that formed substances can alter the abuser's biological meta metabolism and or brain chemistry. Uh, however, we believe that even heavy substance abusers retain quite a bit of control. This is key. Even heavy substance abusers retain quite a bit of control. Secondly, we would say this. The biblical counselors reject biological determinism. For instance, studies indicate 10-20% of all drinkers annually quit drinking entirely on their own. Now, that's significant. Entirely on their own. Um, so, again, that reinforces the idea that we have much more control than oftentimes we are willing to admit. Thirdly, we would say that biblical determinism, or biological, I should say, determinism is a closed system. It's a closed system. You're basically, there's no other influence that's really significant here. Well, hereditary factors. It is the theory of heredity that postulates that all chemical abuse follows genetic predisposition. For example, some research has shown that the children of heavy drinkers tend to have a 66 to 75 percent greater chance of being heavy drinkers as well. And the percentage does not change even if the children were adopted into non-drinking homes. The landmark study was done in Denmark on the records of 5,483 persons who were adopted at an early age. It revealed that the sons of alcoholics who had been adopted by other family members were three plus times more likely to become alcoholics than the adopted sons of non-alcoholics. A similar study of Swedish records had similar results. Male adoptees whose biological fathers were severely alcoholic had a 20% incidence of alcohol abuse compared to 6% in adopted sons whose biological fathers were not heavy drinkers. When the biological mother was an alcohol abuser, the rate was even higher. 28% of adopted sons were abusers. Now, I hope you followed some of those statistics and it wasn't just mind-numbing to you because I want to make a couple of comments about this. There are some problems. When you read studies like that, carefully note exactly what they're saying. For example, number one, genetic studies here, by their own statistics, are not conclusive. Since, if you look at the statistics, as much as 70% of the sample was not affected, proves there has got to be other factors that are at work. So they're saying 28% <clears throat> here, uh, of adopted sons were abusers of some kind of chemical or alcohol. Well, that means 70% of them were not. So what are we going to say about that 70%? So there's got to be extra, if it was firm causality, there was direct cause and effect here, then you would think it would be 100% would be involved in the alcohol. Yes. Okay. All right. Secondly, biblical counselors reject this is what we would call genetic fatalism because it grants natural forces the ultimate control of destiny and discounts supernatural intervention. We would reject that. We would believe that God can supernaturally intervene in this particular process no matter how hopeless this person may be or their family members for that matter. So we would reject genetic uh, fatalism. Thirdly, Biblical counselors do not deny that different substances will affect different people in different ways. Some people are more prone to certain sins than others. But these tendencies, now quoting, certainly do not mean that self-discipline is impossible or that personal responsibility is diminished. It doesn't mean that at all. And you can see that that's actually a quote. That latter part is really a quote that's taken out of Ed Welch's um, 
article, Sin or Sickness, the Biblical Counseling in the Medical Model in the Journal of Pastoral Practice. Going clear back to 1990. So, it doesn't mean, uh, certainly doesn't mean that self-discipline is impossible or that personal responsibility is diminished. It doesn't mean that at all. Alright, so then, based upon this, what is the biblical model? That's the critical question here. What is the biblical model? Understanding the biblical model involves a careful review of Harmar theology, the doctrine of sin. If there's going to be an adequate biblical understanding of the problem, there must be a biblical explanation of the abuser's raw feelings of being out of control. Listen to the testimony of one pastor's wife when drink dominated her life. Quoting her, this is what she said. Once again, I did the deeds I hated. I found myself on that terrible list in the Bible of those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. I knew no Christian as bad as I. God forgives the worst sinner. I knew and believed that. But could God forgive a repeat offender? Again, I had to embrace the temptation instead of fleeing it. End of quote. Now, when you get a woman that's caught up with a chemical abuse like she was, and she's hung, hooked on that so bad, shallow explanations of sin are not going to help this kind of a desperate wife. It's not going to help her. So what do we understand about this? Number one, this. Human depravity has an intensifying potential. If we understand the doctrine of harmartiology, we're not as bad as we could be. That gives you a lot of hope, isn't it? We're not as bad as we could be. Um, in fact, Adam says in his book, um, A Theology of Christian Counseling, he says, but when we speak of total depravity, we must take, make it clear that this is, does not mean that every person is as bad as he might be. Rather, the idea behind the word total is that all parts and all aspects of his life is depraved. No area has escaped sin's blighting effects. So, we're not as bad as we could be. So, once the sinful abuse, once we've chosen to go down that road, then you notice what happens here. Um, once that occurs, then um, the habituation of sin starts to take over. Our, there, we seek, we're seeking actually feelings of satisfaction. Um, Decrease satisfaction with the same amount of that particular chemical or drug leads to greater usage. And when there is greater usage, there is greater habituation of the sin. That's important to understand. Um, this line represents the point at which um, that particular chemical becomes normal in a person's life. In other words, I have to have the chemical in order for my day to be normal. That's that line right there. When that particular line is crossed, that's when usually organic damage occurs. That means the body is actually damaged. And this is where a person can be legitimately described as being enslaved, or we could capitulate to the world's definition, or um, enslaved or addicted or in bondage. That's when a person is finally in bondage. Where they, this habituation of sin has taken place to the point that they have to have it in order to feel normal. That's when they're enslaved. It's one thing to desire a drug. It's different or chemical to actually be enslaved by that particular drug. And I think... That normality is the line that is crossed here. Um, we could, prior to this, life was normal without the drug, even though we wanted it really bad. After it, life is normal only with the drug. All right, so this becomes key. And this is the slavery that is, is critical here that ends up taking over and throbs, if you will, in that person's life. All right. Secondly, sin's desire is to enslave and to control. Um, there is no misery in the garden. There was no misery in the garden before the fall, and all pain, crying, etc., will be eliminated. Um, 
I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but sin's desire ultimately is to control. Uh, thirdly, the helpless feeling of being out of control is part of the misery of God's judgment upon man's sin. It's part of the misery of God's judgment. Pain, sorrow, and other forms of human misery came as a result of the curse. So the more a person became enslaved, um, then the greater the misery. Fourth, the Christian who is, is snared by an addictive substance must understand that the painful discipline of self-denial is balanced by God's wise purposes in providence. It's balanced by God's wise purposes in providence. It's important to see that. Um, uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11 is key here. Pain is used by God for numerous purposes. God uses pain to remind us that all is not right here in this world and to fix our hope on the coming life when it will be. Pain now is used to purify and to teach us. That's the idea. Fifth, the, the experience of feeling out of control does not diminish your responsibility for your condition. Um, in fact, the experience, experience of feeling out of control in no way diminishes it because our sinfulness, in our sinfulness, we are simultaneously enslaved and yet at the same time calculating. We're enslaved and calculating. So how do you deal with this? Coming back to the question of how do you counsel someone who has this particular problem? Well, A here, breaking a life-dominating sin habit involves a total life restructuring. That's what it's going to involve. Breaking this sin habit involves a total life restructuring. You can see this on how using the biblical categories of something that's enslaving that is purposeful and then involving the weakness of the body. When you take the substance in order to feel good or feel relief or to experience something new that you haven't experienced before, then as a result of that, the body in response becomes weak to that particular substance. There is weakness that's there. Eventually, you take it enough where actually addiction occurs. The natural desires that are a part of both the mind or heart and the body now become enslaved um, or at the mercy of seeking the feelings of goodness from that substance. Which brings us to an important principle here. And the principle... Uh, we'll look at here in just a second. Um, but that's the idea. Um, and this is where uh, ultimately bondage and slavery then takes place when the body has succumbed to this. It's where bondage and slavery takes place. Um, well, you can see this. Th this is life dominating sin because it has to do with every aspect of the abuser and the desire for chemicals affect that person's, uh, uh, how they spend their money. Uh, it affects their marriage. It affects their children. Um, it also affects the friends that they have. Um, it affects their work. It affects their time. And it affects their church. And it affects their Bible study. So, and we could list probably far more than that that's there. That's the reason why there has to be total life restructuring. It's very difficult to see, but you can kind of see it. Um, so chemical abuse becomes a life-dominating sin when it touches every area of their life. It touches every single area of their life. That's when it's life dominating. So that's why we say you need total life restructuring. They have to learn how to reuse their money, how to treat their wife or their husband, or how to treat their children properly, because now that chemical is taken out, and it's no longer a part, the central uh, dominating factor in their life. 
So this is an important principle. The goal of biblical counseling, understand, is easily lost when the incessant demands of chemical abuse. Your goal for them must always be to become God's kind of person, not just stop the abuse. It's easy to get sucked up in that. But our goal here is to be God's kind of person. Our goal is not to just get them out of the abuse. Placemone is a word that means it's the process of indulging in or procuring the satisfaction of specific desires and needs. These desires quickly command all of the abuser's life. Every aspect of their life comes under its demanding influence. Colossians 2.23 uses this term. Human laws and external restraints cannot keep the flesh from satisfying itself. Place Monet. In other words, this is a person who wants to indulge every, everything. Indulge in or procure almost at any cost sometimes the satisfaction of specific desires and needs. You can't put behavioristic rules and regulations on a person like that whose heart is demanding these things. They have to change from the heart. That's the idea behind this place of me. And of course, the typical word for lust is the word epithumia, or uh, thamao, which is the verb form. Uh, epithumia is the noun form. To strongly desire, lust, or covet after. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, the body lusts after the spirit, or against the spirit. So this lust can be against the spirit. Galatians 5, 16, we should not fulfill the desires of the body. Ephesians 4, 22, fleshly desires are self-deceiving. Um, Titus 2, 12, we should deny ungodliness and worldly desires. James 1, 14, fleshly desires will lure us away from godliness. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6, arm yourselves with this attitude to suffer. Why? For what purpose? And this is interesting because this is very helpful in counseling a person in some kind of substance abuse. So if you want to take your Bible real quickly and go over there. We're almost finished here, but in 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6, it says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now there's a principle there. Talking about we as human beings, when we go through suffering, it has a purifying effect. It causes us to cease from sin. So the withdrawal effect of substance will send them through suffering. But that suffering, they've got to understand, is a good thing. <clears throat> it helps to purify us. So as to, to live the rest of the time in flesh, no longer in the lusts of men, but for the will of God. <clears throat> is the idea. <clears throat> so, in 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6, the suffering for godliness cleanses your life, verse 1 says. It strengthens you to live a whole life of godliness, verse 2 says, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. It prevents you from wasting your life, verse 3 says, for the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. <coughs> idolatries. So it prevents you from wasting your life being consumed by those lusts. It's vitally, it's vital, and it's critical that the person that you're counseling understands that particular principle. <coughs> <clears throat> That's what ultimately it's going to do. Now, furthermore, how is life wasted? 1 Peter 4, 3 tells us living by desires is over for the Christian. Three perfect tenses in this verse emphasizes that the past conduct is a closed chapter in their life. Living with unrestrained spirit, which is the course of sensuality. Living with wanted, unchecked passion. In this ca case, epithemeo. Lust, <clears throat> living as a habitual drunkard. The context shows habituation here and a, going after all kinds of drinking parties as well. Carousing with other drunks, swaying and singing is the idea behind it. Partying with other drunks. That's how life is wasted. 
It's no longer live for the Lord or to serve the Lord, worshiping pleasure and desire, which is abominable idolatries. Now, permanent change then is a two-factor process we talked about before. There has to be across-the-board lifestyle negation. Think, why do people drink? To escape guilt, to punish themselves, to assert their autonomy, to relieve pressure in life. Uh, that's a lot of reasons why people do this. So expect people who stop their chemical abuse to have these troubles return. That's the reason why you need to counsel them that God is the answer to the guilt. God is the answer to this self-flagellation. Sometimes they drink to punish themselves, which is kind of a penance for their sin. Christ has already taken their punishment for sin. Or to assert their autonomy becomes a self-assertion. You know, a lot of young people go out as a rebellion against their parents and they get drunk to assert their autonomy or to relieve pressure. Those things will come back to their life once they get off the alcohol. So you have to address that on a heart level. All right, the addictive heart is a continual idol factory. That's what's key here. Um, so to escape guilt, punish self, assert their autonomy, relieve pressure, um, that's what the heart will do, uh, which demands uh, achievement uh, or demands some kind of appeasement, I should say. Um, uh, this is part of the early cycle of addiction, so they seek it in the chemical. The body, the brain craves pleasurable and physical sensations, and then satisfaction ultimately is found in some kind of chemical or some kind of alcohol which just reinforces now the addicted heart. And wants the heart now um, to follow in suit. And it, it, then it demands more, which then the body and the brain craves more. And there's more satisfaction to that experience, which reinforces this. So there is what oftentimes is addiction or... We could say bondage that ultimately takes place. Every chemical abuser should commit this particular <clears throat> verse to memory. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than when their wine and uh, grain and new wine abound. In other words, rather than allowing the wine to give you gladness, it is the Lord ultimately that should give you gladness. They must uh, learn that only the Lord can replace their idolatrous demands with righteous joy. Only the Lord can do that, ultimately. So, the early cycle of addiction gets them hooked, if you will. Then, the later cycle, this change then has to include radical amputation. The enslaved heart, I won out, but I won in too. That's what the enslaved heart says in the later stages of addiction, which demands some kind of appeasement in this case, and um, then some kind of ultimate, the body and brain craves more now, because now that it's enslaved, it finds its satisfaction in that element. Well, how do you break that cycle? The old cravings of the heart are replaced with righteous passions. The pure heart I want what my Lord wants. There's the replacement, um, ultimately. And that's where you find, that's what the heart demands, and that's where you find appeasement. Uh, the body and the brain craves now righteousness more than anything else in life, which brings about the satisfaction that they ultimately like or want, which now produces a God-honoring life. So that's what should be happening in life. Now, involvement of other church members is often necessary in terms of accountability, not as a support group, not as a therapy group, not for sympathy or for slander, but for discipleship and accountability and righteousness, not just soberness. So, we are exactly at 15 after the hour. But I wanted to at least give you how we ought to approach and think about the chemical abuser, especially as our society wants us to constantly label these people as being sick. And then there are elements in the Christian church 
who view these chemical abuses as the impardonable sins. They're not. There is a biblical way to address these that is God-honoring that can bring about permanent satisfaction and change. 